All right. Um, good to see everybody, uh, and uh, absolutely uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your Wednesday. Um, thanks for joining us in a new venue for this uh, university forum. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today during the session, but I just I do want to note that. Um, you know, for uh, a number of us, I'd say probably many of us, uh, a challenging week in uh, a few different ways on this campus. Uh, we talk a lot about um, our people and our community, and I think it's, uh, it's been an exceptionally difficult um, stretch. Uh, and folks work through difficult times in very different ways, uh, and I think um, uh, you'll know what works best for you. But uh, as I wrote in an earlier communication to campus, I think this is a time that for many of us it makes sense and there's value in, in leaning on each other, um, supporting each other even more so than we do on, on a typical day or in a typical week. So thinking of all of you absolutely uh, during this time. Um, it's not actually a humorous uh, transition, but there is a bit of humor in it. At the last university forum, we focused quite a bit on campus construction and parking challenges. And so, of course, <laughs> as I blitzed up here from Cohotus, because first I thought we were over in the Northern Center again and realized we were going to Jamrich, but then I blitzed over here and drove into the parking lot behind Jamrich and Hedgecock, I realized there is, in fact, uh, very little parking available. Um, and, and so I had to move on to an... Is that your truck on the lawn? <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just, I just slid it up onto the... Well, no, I, I did find a suitable parking spot. It, and I say it's not humorous because there are real consequences to the parking shortage right now. And I know that for our students, for our staff, for our employees um, uh, in general, it's just um, a, a, another kind of headache at this point. Um, uh, and it can be a significant one, especially if you're like me and often running uh, uh, just a, a tad bit late. It is toward a greater end. And I think as I reflect on that last university forum and as I look at the construction projects underway, in particular here thinking about Hardin Hall and what will go into Hardin Hall, um, there's great light at the end of that tunnel. I mean, it's toward a fantastic end. We're just gonna have to muscle through some shorter term uh, difficulties. This is our third forum, uh, and, and we've had university forums uh, in the past, I mean, well before I got here, but in this kind of recent incarnation, um, it is our third forum. We hosted a forum in the fall. As I mentioned, a second forum, kind of around special topics, parking and construction. That was about a month and a half ago, um, a month or so ago. And then, and then today, uh, we have uh, our, spring, our spring forum. We'll pick up again in the fall, and uh, of course, from time to time, we'll host special forums if, uh, if need be. I uh, think it's uh, customary at any point in our academic year to say it's an exceptionally busy time of year, but it is right now truly an exceptionally busy time of year as we ramp up for the end of the semester, but are not quite there you know, where we can sort of sense that we're near the finish line. And uh, it can make it difficult for us to take advantage of all of the programming and opportunities on campus. I do want to highlight for you all tomorrow, um, we are of course hosting our 17th, our 17th year of the United Conference, which is just a real gem at Northern. Uh, it's evolved a bit over the years, but um, uh, truly at this point in time, it is, it is our kind of signature celebration of diversity and inclusion, uh, well-being on our campus. And tomorrow's program, if you haven't looked at it, um, is really a tremendous program. I encourage you to visit the Northern Center. Kind of dovetailed with that is the Wellbeing Fair, um, which is uh, occurring um, right near many of the um, United Conference panels and, and, and keynotes. Uh, but please do check out the program. Stephanie Fu will be discussing uh, the common read, uh, What My Bones Know. The day, of course, will start off fantastically uh, with some opening comments from uh, Sean Reese Campbell, who you'll hear from in just uh, a minute. And uh, Sean Reese, first of all, welcome. And second of all, thank you for opening up United uh, tomorrow. So please do make some time to visit if you can. Today, um, the forum agenda is uh, pretty straightforward. 
we decided we'd work on this rhythm. We would have a university assembly, which meets once a semester. It's about 150 or so folks uh, drawn from uh, students, staff, faculty, their community members as part of the assembly. And after each assembly meeting, the assembly offers us feedback on some key topics that they think would be of interest to the entire university. And so they develop a list for us, and then we use that list in order to develop the agenda for these meetings. As we got feedback from the University Assembly, sort of four topics really stood out. <laughs> Astonishingly, for the first time ever, budget and budget planning showed up as a topic of key interest for our, I, I say that tongue in cheek, no, not surprisingly, budget and, bu uh, and budgetary planning is of key interest to the university. Um, that will absolutely be a topic of an upcoming forum. We'll have more opportunities to engage uh, in, in uh, discussion around budget. Uh, on this particular day, which has been long scheduled, um, our vice president for finance and admin, uh, Gavin Leach, is uh, out, of, uh, out of town, actually out of state at this point probably, uh, on um, a, a, a personal matter, and so he can't be here today. But that was one topic uh, that, of course, we're looking to address. There were three other topics that kind of stood above the, the rest in terms of feedback from the assembly. The first one is not disconnected at all uh, from uh, budget, and that is uh, our enrollment picture. Uh, we think about enrollment on this campus, uh, both in terms of new students and retention. Uh, among many other things, we look at enrollment because it drives our tuition revenue and has a budget impact. So um, actually, uh, in the middle of our program, we'll hear from Carrie Garcia, our director of admissions uh, around uh, uh, admissions and, and enrollment. Uh, a second topic of significant interest is really around uh, new leadership. And I am, you know, uh, a weathered old veteran at this point in time. I am no longer considered new leadership, which I think is actually a very good thing. But we have three fantastic new leaders um, uh, on this campus. We have more than that. But we have three uh, new leaders at, at the kind of uh, executive council level. Anna Dalman, uh, our new provost, will join us on April 1st. So she's also not able to be here today. But I really look forward to having you spend some time with Anna Dalman uh, in the near future. Uh, we do have two new leaders in our people, culture, and well-being pillar. And remember, this pillar has a number of different functions, but one big part of that pillar is that it reflects our commitment to the Okanagan Charter, this kind of comprehensive approach to well-being. You know, personal well-being, the well-being of our campus and campus culture, and then the well-being of place. So we have leaders in place to drive progress in each one of those areas. Uh, you all have had a chance to get to know Abigail Weich, and I don't know if Abigail is, there's Abigail. Um, and Abigail, may, maybe you also fall outside the category of new at this point in time, but you certainly play an important role uh, in our Okanagan uh, commitment. A second new leader uh, who's not new to Northern, but is new in this position, Jess Thompson is here, and we'll talk a little bit about her role as our Assistant Vice President for Sustainability, and we'll see how that fits into our Okanagan uh, commitment. And Sean Reese Campbell, again, welcome Sean Reese, uh, is our newest uh, 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 leader on stage, and she is our Assistant Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, and has hit the ground running in all sorts of ways, including, as I mentioned, the, the opening remarks for our United Conference tomorrow. So in addition to hearing about enrollment, we'll hear from uh, new leadership. And then to get back to the topic of construction and enrollment, we're under a lot of pressure with respect to housing capacity on this campus. It's a terrific problem to have, but we are bas basically at capacity. Jeff Corpy would tell me we're actually probably above where we want to be in terms of capacity. And we need to look at that in terms of um, you know, long-term development of new housing options for our students. And nothing final uh, to present today, but I think in the spirit of kind of open communication and giving you a heads up, Jeff's going to walk through some of the options we're considering when it comes to bolstering um, housing capacity. Uh, I feel my internal alarms going off, so uh, I know I'm, I'm uh, 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 up here a bit, a bit longer than I anticipated. But allow me uh, also just uh, one or two side points before I hand it off to, uh, to Sean Reese. One is Wildcat Weekend. All right, this past weekend we had, I think, 900, uh, or almost 900 uh, prospective students and, and family friends in the ballrooms. I, I, biggest group since before COVID. Um, fantastic to see all those folks in there. Great to meet them. A huge student turnout, current student turnout to help support that event. And afterwards, we always hear about 
how successful that event is. Right. And you think about, okay, well, what makes that event successful? I think, you know, it's good to hear about the programming, the, the campus facilities look great. Lots of people haven't been to Marquette before and they like the place. It is absolutely uh, uh, the case that when we ask, well, why was it successful? And those prospective students and their families give us feedback. It's because of the people they met here. And, and the people they meet during Wildcat Weekend are not just our admission staff or our campus visit folks. It's the academic focus areas that really constitute the heart of Wildcat Weekend. It's the campus tour uh, 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 staff who help make it a special experience. It's getting to meet those current students who take the time and energy um, to discuss what they love about Northern and maybe what they find challenging about Northern. So I want to extend a really broad thank you um, to everyone who dedicates time, I mean, on a Saturday in order to make that event such a success. A second uh, key point is around strategic planning. You all have been hearing about this. Uh, I know we had our interim strategic plan, and I hope you've heard that we're in the middle of our uh, process for designing a new strategic plan at Northern. And that process really began with a lot of community listening. Towards the end of the fall, we hosted a community visioning dinner. Uh, I think we had about 70 or so community members come in and just talk a little bit about what was possible for Northern in Marquette, the central UP in this region. We had student facilitators. It was a fantastic kickoff. And since that time, we've continued to gather community feedback. We've had surveys, alumni, uh, surveys on campus. And we've moved into more specific engagement sessions, an engagement session with our board of trustees, with the university assembly, uh, yesterday, just yesterday, with the president's leadership council. Jason and his team have visited our executive council. And then in the next month and a half or so, there'll be a set of virtual and in-person campus engagement sessions. If you all know Jason Nicholas, and I don't think I saw Jason here, then you know our Institutional Effectiveness Office. They are data geeks beyond compare, and they are absolutely driven by the information they're collecting from these sessions. It's making a huge difference, difference in the direction of the plan. So it, it's, it's kind of a request. It's kind of a gentle nudge. It may be a bit of a more than a gentle nudge, but a bit of a push. Please engage those sessions when um, you, know, you see them coming up. If you can't join in person, there's gonna be one virtually. Let us know what you think. There are ample chances to react, to provide inputs, and that is what's shaping this strategic plan. I'm really excited for us to see how it comes together towards the end of the semester and the kind of final polished plan along with some big grand projects we'll pursue be um, unveiled in the fall when we come back for fall classes. Uh, Okay, the last point is really uh, a student point, and I think, Gwen, uh, you're here. I don't I wanna speak for you, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I wanted to just let everyone know, um, we do have an important referendum coming from uh, uh, the students, and the students will vote on this, but it's about the, the student fee, and I don't know the deep history here, I won't embarrass myself by getting any of the numbers wrong, but it's been quite a while since we've had a significant increase in the student fee. That, that all students pay at Northern. Um, and that's a good thing in many respects. I mean, we talk a lot about affordability and making sure we keep costs as low as possible. The reality, though, is that the, the costs of doing business for our student organizations, for student government, continue to skyrocket. And we talk about inflation. Uh, the university, uh, of course, sees that in many different ways. Our employees feel that directly. Uh, the university feels it directly in terms of the costs we have, and our student orgs and ASNMU feel that in terms of the cost of doing their business. And so whether it's running student organizations like um, Radio X, ASNMU, the Northwind, whether it's trying to bring big speakers like John Green to campus or run other programming, those costs continue to go up. And so I think the students will be considering a substantial, I think, $13 uh, increase in their student fee. Uh, the administration is supportive of that, but also very respectful of whatever outcome uh, 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 emerges from that referendum. If you have questions, I won't put you on the spot, Gwen, but I'm sure our, our ASNMU team uh, will be here to answer them. Okay. Any pressing questions from the forum before I uh, introduce our next speaker and we move on with the program? Okay, I will neither take that as a good thing nor a bad thing. It's just a thing. Maybe it's a get on with the program, President Tessman thing. I am so excited. We had a, a, a national search. Uh, it was a highly competitive search. I am deeply appreciative to the search committee, to the campus for engaging in our search as we looked for 
uh, our assistant vice president of diversity and inclusion. And I'll tell you, rarely do the stars align where, you know, the feedback you get from campus, the feedback you get from the search committee, and ultimately the feelings you have yourself all lead to the same candidate. We found a terrific new uh, leader in Sean Reese Campbell. And Dr. Campbell is going to speak to you a little bit uh, this afternoon, just about some initial observations and maybe some initial thoughts uh, on how Northern can pursue diversity and inclusion on our campus. Welcome, Sean Reese. Blue Zoo. Did I get that right? Yeah. How are you, all of you this afternoon? Good. It's good to see you, and it's good to be here. It's great to be here, actually. I'm very honored um, to have been offered the position and was very eager to accept. Um, I'm going to <clears throat> tell you about a number of activities that I have going on out of my office, uh, which will also point towards the directions that, um, uh, that I'm leading that particular office and the connections that I'm making with you. A lot of these uh, um, initiatives came out of conversations that I've had in my first two months, whether virtual or in person with you all. Okay. And so as Brock mentioned, the United Conference is tomorrow, and our keynote lunch speaker is Patrick Yankee from Corktown Health, who will be who will be discussing affirmative health care for the LGBTQ plus community. And in the evening, the keynote speaker is Stephanie Fu, author of the book What My Bones Know, which is a diversity common reader. As in the past, all employees are eligible for two hours of release time to attend with supervisory approval. Okay. Um, next is um, the Assistant Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion Fellows Program. So some of you may have seen that email that came out about a couple of weeks ago. Um, an AVP of Diversity and Inclusion Fellow is a faculty member who partners with senior administration to increase faculty involvement in the areas of diversity, identify needed areas of support, work with student affinity groups, and work on projects and initiatives to advance inclusion and belonging on campus. The goal of the program is to provide exceptional faculty members with a more expansive range of leadership experiences at the campus level. As far as the appoint appointment goes, fellows will have up to 12 credits of reassigned time per academic year with replacement costs covered by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. The appointment is for two years, and though there is an, a possibility of extension if warranted. Um, fellows are provided some funding to continue their involvement during the summer as determined by the office, and fellows will also be provided a modest uh, discretionary travel and or training budget. Uh, applications are being accepted through April 10th. Okay. Um, at this time, I'm also um, hiring uh, in the process of doing a hiring search for assistant director of diversity and inclusion. Um, the primary responsibilities of this person uh, are to serve as the principal investigator for the um, King Chavez Parks grants and create programming to satisfy the objectives of the grant goals, work with student organizations leading to uh, promote student success around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and to foster an equitable and inclusive climate for all, and managing the diversity and inclusion office social media accounts, including the Heritage Calendar and upcoming events page. Um, future plans for 2025. So those are all the things that are happening right now towards the end of the semester. Uh, I am in the stages of planning a national BIPOC leadership rest slash well-being retreat um, to be hosted here at Northern. Its focus is BIPOC leadership in higher education. Um, during this retreat, uh, areas of focus will be well-being, particularly in highlighting the UP outdoors, well-being in writing slash journaling, well as decolonized food practices and other rest centering and well-being practices. Um, already have a commitment from 
uh, Northern Michigan alum, Alice Jasper, who is very well known in the BIPOC outdoors area, um, as well as from Dr. Jackie Medina, um, who has agreed to help us uh, in creating the agenda for that rest retreat. So that's coming in summer 2025. <clears throat> And then as a pilot initiative in uh, fall 2024, in order to get to know faculty and students better, um, up to twice a month, I'm willing to come speak as a guest speaker in your classrooms, either focusing on one of my research areas, um, which is food is medicine, writing and well-being, 20th century African-American literature and culture, or to speak about my vision and strategy for diversity and inclusion at Northern and how I see that working and ideas about moving that along. So uh, I'll pilot that again in fall 2024, only up to twice a month, first serve, first come, and we'll see how it goes as far as sustaining that um, in a way that I have capacity to do into the future. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends, colleagues. I got some slides. <laughs> you can take me out of the classroom, but you know. Um, I am really excited about the Okanagan Charter. I've had some time to learn more about it. The Charter offers a transformative vision that directly connects to how we've already been operationalizing sustainability on our campus. For example, it really prioritizes this integrated and holistic thinking that you would find in our current our current sustainability plan, which was drafted by students in Dr. Sarah Middlefelt's class in, um, was that winter 2021? Yeah. And if you like read this opening, you'll, I love this language. We recognize that the Anishinaabe people have inhabited this land for thousands of years and have, have practiced what is now known as sustainability. We hope to continue to cooperatively care for this land sustainably, much like the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples continue to do around the world. So I'm gonna share some quick updates, just like Sean Reese did. Many of these initiatives were already in the works, if not for months, maybe four years um, prior to, um, to the, today. And it really represents the outstanding leadership, again, from Dr. Sarah Middlefelt and Brandon Sager, who were the former co-chairs for the President's Sustainability Advisory Council. Uh, as well as the work of thousands, if not hundreds, of very passionate students who have moved the needle of sustainability on our campus. And on that note, I just wanna ask in this room, how many of you would say that some aspect of sustainability, that includes social justice, economic equity, or environmental responsibility, is a part of, at least a fraction of, the work that you do at NMU? Look at all those heads. Yes, this, yes. Um, so a lot of things are happening all over campus. When we did our last campus-wide sustainability survey, 46 faculty from 20 different departments reported that their research or their teaching had some aspect of sustainability in it. So I feel like I have two major and maybe immediate charges in my new role. And the first is to increase the communication and coordination of all the things that are already going on. And then the second is to help implement, um, I love that that is your ringtone. <laughs> that makes my heart sing, I love it. Um, and the second piece is to help support the implementation of initiatives and activities. So in terms of communication and coordination, a lot going on. Uh, the QR code at the top will take you to our brand new newsletter that Shane, or that Shine intern Paige Whaley um, has been working on. And this week, if you sign up and subscribe, you'll see a new platform. And two of the newest stories are that we are creating a Campus-wide sustainability council. Um, so right now we have a strategic planning focus area group for builders of a culture of sustainability, and we have the Shine Advisory Board. And what we want to do is bring those two groups together to have a single, wider, more representative council that um, operates with the eight guiding principles of the Okanagan Charter. That council will launch in the fall if you wanna find out more. Um, again, the QR code. 
Uh, I've got lots of QR codes, so if you've got your phone out, it's, it's fair. Um, also, following Dr. Campbell's lead, we are gonna pilot a sustainability fellows program, and the fellowship will provide an opportunity for a faculty member to advance an initiative, or it could be research, it could be something in their curriculum related to sustainability on our campus. Same deal, 12 credits of reassigned time to potential for summer and also professional development funding and the details are in the newsletter. Um, in terms of initiatives, a lot going on. I'm gonna highlight six major things. The first is that the carbon neutrality plan was adopted in December. Since then, we've been doing a lot of research on the different opportunities here. There's some state and federal funding available that makes um, nonprofit public institutions like us ripe for opportunity. We have an awesome intern, Colibri Drobish, um, who's also a Nordic skier out at Nationals right now. Um, and she has been helping to calculate NMU's greenhouse gas emissions for last year and um, help us figure out a way to make an annual reporting cycle that is public, transparent, and on the web. She's also helping to map a process for our scope three emissions. This is a big undertaking that requires a lot of institutional data and collaboration, and there's no way that we could do a minute of it without Kathy Richards and her assistance. Um, every time I talk to people at other schools, I realize how lucky I am to work with Kathy Richards um, on this effort and many others. This year, students submitted 22 green fund proposals. That's the most we've ever got. They ranged from zero dollars to a quarter of a million dollar projects. A lot of them were related to landscaping. And so we've shared those proposals with Jim Toms, also wonderful to work with, and the Smith Group, which is the consulting group helping on Wildcat Way and um, the new, can I talk about the new landscape master plan? Um, and what's really exciting is they've taken those proposals seriously and instead of making those green fund projects, we're looking at all the opportunities and ways that we can make our campus the most pollinator friendly and biodiverse possible. So look for some exciting things to happen there. Um, some green fund projects that you will see over the summer, um, improved messaging about re recycling as well as um, some textbook little libraries, some innovation in takeout container recycling, and hopefully a solar-powered e-bike charging station. Speaking of student-led initiatives, we have a really dynamic group um, in athletics. So a group of student athletes is leading the Green Athletics Working Group, and they've put together a strategy to improve education and outreach in their division, as well as to reduce the impact and emissions of NMU athletics. Um, I know we'll be hearing more from this motivated team led by women's basketball star, McKaylee Kuhn. And we have also made some big moves when it comes to post-consumer composting. This one has been 10 years in the making. Um, but now we have this fantastic partnership with Partridge Creek Farms. And a big shout out to Paul Schoenfeld, who without his leadership and investment and patience, um, I don't know where he'd be, but he's helped NMU take post-consumer composting to the next level. Right now, compost crews are working at Northern Lights Dining to divert lunch and dinner waste from the landfill, and we're exploring all the ways to scale and extend that effort across campus. In terms of curriculum, I'm working with an awesome team um, to explore the opportunities for curated interdisciplinary experiences without adding any new courses or any requirements. Could we build some pathways or tracks in our general education program around Okanagan related themes like sustainability. This really is a packaging project um, and it should not require too much additional paperwork. But if you are interested and wanna explore options, we're gonna have a strategic doing workshop on April 5th. RSVP to Veronica Kusick. <laughs> yes, she's right there. Um, okay. Is it W-K-U-S-E-K -E at NMU.edu? Just so we have enough breakfast and beverages for everyone. Okay, and the last thing I wanna share is that this spring we're partnering with the Superior Watershed Partnership and Marquette County Climate Adaptation Task Force to um, host a series of community learning circles about climate change. Our invitation is to the entire community and it is, quote, under the conditions of a changing climate with equality and justice in mind, how might we address the following issues? 
food systems and security, materials management, energy and power, water and land use, population health and infrastructure, economic development and diversification. Let's have the conversations today that we need for the next 25 years. Um, finally, some upcoming events. The Eco Reps have an event planned every week for the rest of the semester. Really neat programming. Um, those students are incredible, and um, if you haven't seen or heard of them, please check out what they've got on tap. Uh, our climate at noon has been thriving, and we have our last seminar on Friday, April 12th. The celebration of student scholarship is featuring sustainability. Um, we'll have a green room with everything from poetry to particulate matter. Stop by, and finally, this is the 10th anniversary of John Anderton's Earth Week, and the amazing GTU students in the EGS department have been coordinating an incredible week of programming kicks off on Earth Day, the 22nd, ends on Arbor Day, the 26th. You'll definitely see Okanagan themes of holistic and intersectional sustainability, well-being, and D&I are featured in all of the events. I feel like I'm, I'm getting the encroachment here. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Stay tuned for more news. And next up is Carrie Garcia to give you an enrollment update. A classic example of uh, you know body language and misinterpretation. I didn't mean to rush you off. I just realized I was supposed to introduce you as well, Jess, and kind of make sure we tie some of these things together. Um, you know, uh, thank you first of all, uh, Sean Reese, for again just sharing some initial observations and um, really hitting the ground running. In addition to you know your um, creation of the diversity um, uh, uh, fellows program. Um, thinking about getting back in the classroom and adding to uh, some of the topics that, that we might be able to offer our students is really fantastic. Jess, thank you. Uh, I knew you would come with PowerPoints, so that's all, all good and, and really beneficial. It, and the reason I wanted to jump back up here is I, I have, I guess, a real moment and, and say, look, you know, we're investing, uh, of course, um, uh, time and energy and in, and in positions um, you know, related to well-being, um, related to sustainability and diversity and inclusion. That's an intentional decision. I mean, that's a decision a number of folks help make, but I mean that, that I am making because in the time that I've been at Northern, that's what I hear from our students, what I hear from our staff, our faculty, from community members in terms of sort of what defines Northern as an institution, what defines the interests of our employees and our students and our community members, in areas where what we can do is better connect, um, elevate, and expand our work like inside the classroom and also operationally. I mean, some of the things that are so interesting to me about uh, sustainability, for example, uh, oh my gosh, yeah, Paul, what can we do down in the dining halls if we think about partnering with somebody like Partridge Creek and attracting students? Because you know, that's something I think a lot of our students are interested in, kind of working on composting and diverting things from landfill. In terms of uh, landscaping, I mean, what's possible in terms of, of sustainability, pollinator-friendly campus? I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's not something that I would have thought of. And I think that all of us, given our portfolios and our, and our work requirements, we're doing work in these areas, we have interest in these, in these areas, but even being able to tie our work together in new ways is what's gonna allow us to make rapid progress and generate a lot of impact for the, for the people we serve and for ourselves. And so I just wanted, I was sitting there listening, I wanted to highlight what I see as the value of that investment in, in, in tying together um, the work that's happening on this campus and has been happening for a long time and then identifying new opportunities uh, for us to work together. So I appreciate again your comments. Uh, we'll point out that um, uh, the work that Sean Reese and Jess do does connect quite neatly with uh, Abigail and you will just continue to hear more and more about our Okanagan commitment. I'm fond of saying it, but I really believe this can be true. We were you know, the 17th institution in the US to adopt the Okanagan Charter. I think already we're moving to the front of, pa of the pack in terms of our implementation of the charter. And I would think over the next you know, three years, what you'll see is Northern becoming more and more visible and noted for the way in which we're approaching well-being in each of these different areas um, and making a difference, again, for our employees and our students and our community. Um, and 
a bit of a segue here, but before we make that segue, uh, as we have Jess and Sean Reese available, I want to make sure we retain the forum aspect of this and see if there are any questions, and I'm volunteering both Sean Reese and Jess to answer questions if they pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear you. And look, I, <laughs> I have like just about the best parking setup that somebody could imagine, right? I mean, there's a spot for me. And, and like, and so uh, I'm really conscious of these moments. It's really humbling, you know, like, okay, gosh, you know what? We have a lot of commuter students, a lot of faculty and staff who are, you know, coming to campus one, two times a day. I mean, I, I know for a fact that there are folks on our campus who have a difficult time leaving their office for lunch because they're worried that they can't get back in and park and resume their duties. And it's like that just that times a thousand happens every day and every week across campus. You mentioned Wildcat Way. I mean, to me, Wildcat Way is exciting. I think a lot about spaces for art, outside instructional spaces, um, you know, an opportunity to connect campus in, in, in ways that are easy for pedestrians and bikes. I think this is a really important point. It's also this window where we can crack open, generally speaking, our transportation plan for campus. And part of that is going to absolutely include parking for vehicles because we don't have all of our students or in fact most of our employees who live within distance to be able to walk or bike to campus and then that ties into all sorts of questions about housing costs and Marquette etc so it's gonna have to be part of the plan and and uh, I don't have any information on that already but I appreciate the the flag there as we're designing you know um, you know new spaces to sit and hold class during the nice month of September with Wildcat Way let's also make sure that doesn't displace another 15 or 20 parking spots that we still uh, need in order to make the campus function well for our employees and students yeah it's park it's a uh, it, yeah parking's a tough one I should have had Sean Reese. You should have answered that question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sean Reese Campbell. Why don't you welcome to Northern? Why don't you answer that question? No. Uh, okay. Uh, so I believe my next duty is to introduce Carrie Garcia, who is a new-ish uh, director of admissions, and you're going to bring us up to speed in terms of what the fall 2024 class looks like, and maybe uh, you know paint some context for us as we. Uh, think about what we can expect, both with respect to new students and transfer students. So thanks a lot, Carrie. Thank you. I do not have a PowerPoint, because no one wants to look at a PowerPoint about numbers, right? Huh. Anyway, so my name is Carrie Garcia. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, my a big, big, big thank you to campus, um, especially for this weekend. If you could have stood there and seen all of the students and families in those ballrooms this weekend, it was insane. It was such a cool experience. It was so exciting to see all of the energy and excitement from all of those families who couldn't wait to be here. Huge success. Um, and there was just a lot of people there. So could have been the weather, but I think it was definitely NMU. Um, many were making their final decisions um, about Northern and if this was gonna be the place for them. Uh, and campus really showed up in a big, big way. We talk a lot about the initiatives and things that we are um, working through and have plans for on this campus. And it translates really well when a mom or a dad is standing there and you're talking about how we're gonna take care of their student, how Northern is gonna show up and take care of them, that's how it translates. And so many parents and families said, I feel comfortable with my leaving my kid here in the fall. You guys solidified that, so thank you. Um, students and families also commented on how friendly campus was, how organized the event was. And believe it or not, how cool our president is. I heard that three times <laughs> from families, so thank you. <laughs> um, so we certainly made an impression and added 115 orientation registrations over the week. 
Yeah, wow, that's exciting. I'm excited for that, yay. So thank you to you for that. Um, so this event is just one way that we stay connected to our admitted students during, especially during this really hard time right now uh, with our financial aid delay. Um, as many of you have heard, that is certainly an issue and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but uh, counselor, our admissions counselors are intentionally reaching out and talking with students and talking with families to keep that conversation going and keep that excitement going. Um, we also, uh, thanks to an investment um, of a SISU grant this year, we were able to create a joint effort between our alumni and our admissions offices uh, to host a variety of events kind of around the country this year. So, so far we've had three, we have about four more in the works, um, and we're inviting admitted students, alumni, and current students to places all over, like Top Golf, Pup Check, uh, we did ice skating, Cool places get students to want to come, and then they get to interact with our community and connect with our alumni, current students, future students. Such a great opportunity, and we're really thankful to SISU for helping us be able to uh, host these events in such a critical time for our students. So we talk a lot about key enrollment trends across the nation right now, and one of them certainly stems from the lack of financial aid information. This is a national issue right now, if you haven't heard. Uh, the FAFSA was delayed because um, the Department of Education is restructuring it, streamlining it, um, making the questions easier to answer, connecting it better with um, uh, the IRS website. So they're, they're working really hard on that. Um, but as you know, how much is it going to cost a student to attend a school is a huge critical piece of information before they actually make a decision on whether or not they want to attend. Um, I talked to a mom this week who, this weekend, she said, my son loves it here. He absolutely loves it here. He has his heart set on this place. We just need to make sure the financial piece works out for us so I don't have to break his heart. I don't wanna break his heart either. Let's please make this work, right? <laughs> Those are the conversations that we've been having uh, right now. But it's such a critical piece of information. Mike Rotundo and his team are working around the clock to make sure that as soon as we have that information, it's, we're, we're working to get that out to families as quickly as possible. So we're really excited about that. We're hoping it comes, it's, it's starting to trickle in, so it's very exciting. But. As for the numbers overall, this year we have certainly seen an increase in uh, applications and admitted students. They're trending upwards um, significantly, mostly due to our partnership with the Common Application. If you haven't heard of the Common App, it's a national admissions application used by uh, colleges and students across the country. It's one seamless application. Students fill it out, they look at profiles of schools, and they click on boxes of where they want to attend. And uh, it certainly increased our admissions applications as well. About 52% of our applications this year are common applications. It's a pretty large number. So certainly raised that bar a little bit for us. Um, in addition to the common application, in combination with NMU's Bridge Award, um, which is a uh, uh, offers non-resident students um, who have at least a 2.25 GPA or higher in-state tuition rates. Um, so the combination of those two things this year resulted in about 44% of our applications are non-resident students right now. And about 60% of our admitted students are non-resident students. So just give you an idea of what this pool looks like that we're working with for sure. Um, Housing and, and orientation indicators are two major indicators that we look at very, very closely. Um, and so as of today, orientation registrations for both first year and transfer students um, were just over 1,000. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, this does include Global Campus as well. Um, we're about 124 over where we were last year. And like I said earlier, we gained about 115 orientation registrations this week. And Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you said we got six during the event. Yes. <laughs> At Wildcat Weekend, they stopped out to register for orientation. They were so excited to be here. So that's pretty cool. Housing registrations are sitting about 945 right now. Um, and that's about 
91 over where we were last year, and we gained 47 this week alone. So we're certainly seeing a lot of movement in the funnel right now, and a lot of, um, a lot of kind of movement in a positive direction. For numbers people, traditionally, Northern has a yield rate um, from our admitted student population to our enrolled population of about 32%. So 32% of our admitted students will enroll at Northern. This has been consistent for as long as I've been here. And this year, it will change. <laughs> the Common App changes that. Um, and, and that's due to the influx in applications that we're seeing our national because they have national visibility. It's a national platform that we're on. Um, lots of schools see a drop in their yield rate because of the influx of applications. It's easy for a student to apply, right? Um, but so I'm expecting our yield rate to be around 17 to 18%-ish. Um, but we're still get, most, we could still could with that drop in that yield rate, could still see a pretty good increase in our incoming class. So even though it's going to drop, we may see some increases. So for those of you that like numbers, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, so for transfer students, it's another interesting trend we're seeing this year is our increase in on-campus transfer student orientations. So we really believe there's a few different reasons that we're seeing this. Um, we have a really great partnership with a platform called Transferology. Uh, some of you may use it to kind of look at various uh, trans um, how credits are transferring in. Um, it's a national transfer credit platform. Um, we also uh, are seeing a little bit of a post-COVID boost as well. Um, students who during the pandemic chose to go to community college are now starting to look at four-year universities. And so we're seeing a little bit of growth beyond that. And we are also in a variety of new markets right now too, beyond just the Midwest. So we're seeing a lot of transfer students from places like Texas and, you know, California and New York and a couple other places too. So we're seeing students from all over the country finding Northern and being very interested in learning more about us and then actually signing up for orientation. So big questions right now are how will financial aid notices impact our current indicators? That's a really big question that hopefully we will have an answer to shortly. <laughs> as soon as things get up and running uh, and out there, hopefully we'll have an idea of where we're really sitting. Um, are we going to be up? Are we going to be down? Once we students find out how much it's going to cost them to attend. Um, and then also, interestingly enough, how are students going to act when they receive that financial aid information now that we've had more time to build that relationship with them? They've been here. They see us. They've met those of us that call Northern home. They are part of our community and they belong here. So now, how are they going to act when they get the financial aid information? Are they going to make decisions that maybe they wouldn't have made? We don't know. So those are big questions that we're looking at right now. Uh, the Department of Education is starting to deliver FAFSA information, and we'll begin to see more of that in the next few weeks, definitely. So um, we're expecting financial aid notices to go out maybe mid-April, maybe a little bit earlier, looking at mid-April. So. Once we receive the FAFSA, once NMU receives the FAFSA from the Department of Education, it takes about two, three to four weeks for Northern to test our systems, to get things up and running, um, and you know, process and test the data, and then we can send notices out. So there is some time there that we need to get prepared as we're getting that information out there. Um, then students need time to digest that information and understand what the costs are from the schools that they're considering, right? And then make some decisions based on that information. And that's if they're in the first batch of financial aid notices that go out. So if they filled out their FAFSA by a certain date, they're gonna be in that first batch. But if they didn't, they won't be, and that process is gonna take longer. So we've got a few barriers we're up against, for sure. So based on that information, if you're looking for a projection, I would suspect we'd have a decent idea of our incoming class, probably late May, maybe early June, um, when students start showing up on campus, because there's so much time and so many things that need to happen because of the financial aid delay. So, so until then, we're going to keep having intentional communication with students one conversation at a time. So, yes. Mm -hmm.
7,000 students, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, so 7,000 freshmen. <laughs> right. I know that's not going to happen. We won't have 7,000 freshmen. No. But um, I, guess, I guess my question is, what's the number you're hoping for? And what's the number you're terrified of? Because I, I know you're understand. I know you're saying that 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 is very possible that this may, because of the common app, these numbers are going to shrink and they'll come down instead of a thirty percent rate, you'll come down to seventeen, eighteen percent. What if it's twenty four? Right? Are you? I mean, is this a oh my god, we need a bigger boat situation? Right? Which is great. It's a great problem to have. But um, what's the number you're hoping for? And what's the number that keeps you up at night? Definitely. <laughs> Always pressing for numbers, right? So number I'm hoping for is maybe about 100 over where we were last year. So think about our freshman class last year was roughly about a little over 1,500. So I feel like projection-wise, we could see about maybe 100 more students and be comfortable in that number. Um, I'm terrified if we yield at 32%. Uh, but I do not think we will. And if we do, Jeff will find a place for them to live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's not allowed to leave. <laughs> yes, exactly. If anyone has an extra room in their house, we could probably use it if we, if we yield that high. So, so those are some numbers, but in general, I'm, I'm feeling pretty optimistic that we're going to land generally where we want to land based on the conversations that we're having, based on how things are kind of climbing and what that's looking like, um, you know, based on other schools as well and kind of where they're starting to see some movement too. Um, I talked to a lot of the admissions directors across the state of the 15 publics just to kind of get a sense of how we're falling and what things are looking like. And, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of great increases, but I would... I would be shocked if we yielded that high. So I'm excited and optimistic that we're going to have an awesome class this year and everyone will have a place to live. Yep. I'm just curious in that space between when people are notified of their FAFSA and when Northern is able to contact them about what they'll receive. Is that space in the system that we have set up to, to manage that internally and timely, how does that match with other sort of peer institutions? Is it, are, are they gonna find out, or is there a possibility they could find out sooner from Northern? What does it mean if they don't find out as soon? Just knowing that we're all in this sort of waiting game, um, what does that look like? Or how, how, are, how, is, um, how are we prepared to manage that time? That's a really awesome question. Um, we are we are very prepared. We have Mike and his team has created every efficiency possible in that process. It used to be four weeks, maybe even a little bit longer, and we've narrowed it down to almost about three weeks based on how we get the information and what's going to happen. Uh, when I talk with the other admissions directors, they also say early to mid April. That's, that's what their financial aid directors are telling them as well. So I think we're all going to be in a similar boat, maybe within a week of each other, getting those notices out to families. Um, we've also sped up how we get that information to students as well. So we've let them know that if they um, sign up for their MyNMU account and they download the application, or the app, the application, they download the app, the MyNMU app, and enable notifications. We'll send them a push notification as soon as their award notice is ready and available to view on their MyNMU account. So they'll have it instantly. Um, and we've been pushing that message out to students. We've been telling them exactly how they become to be in that first batch so that we can get them the information as quickly as possible. Uh, and our counselors are talking to students every single day to say, okay, We'll let you know as soon as it's coming. Let us know if you are waiting or you have, you know, your other three notices and you're waiting on NMU and we can see what's going on. Stay in that. We've been building that relationship for so long that those students are connecting with us to say, hey, where's my stuff? When is it coming? And we can get them that information as quickly as possible. So, but I think we'll all be in with probably within a week of each other because We've made a lot of efficiencies to our programming to, to get it out there as soon as possible. Yep.
Beach, which is about three hours due west, mm -hmm. uh, recently announced some extreme financial difficulty publicly. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any effort to reach out to them and possibly talk about any potentially displaced students? Yes. Uh, as soon as I saw that information, um, we immediately kind of started putting some things into the works to see if, North, North, if Northland was interested in a conversation. Those conversations are certainly um, either started or are getting ready to start. We've had several students already reach out to us to say, hey, North, Northern looks like a great fit. My school might be closing. Can you help me? So we're working through some of those pieces as well. Um, as you know, if you haven't been on Northland College's website, we have a lot of majors that line up really nicely. So I think we will be a good fit. Um, don't tell anyone, but we're also looking to covertly maybe do some geofencing social media target advertising toward their students without anyone knowing, so don't tell anybody. Um, but I think it's important for those students to see what options there are and that if they haven't heard of Northern, that we exist. Um, you know, no one wants to be in that situation. No one wants to be going to a school that may have some financial issues that may be closing right when you're in the middle of your education. And we're very sensitive to all of those pieces and we're just offering a hand to help. Let's help you get through your education. If this does happen, we're here and we can help work you through this. And the environment doesn't seem so different. It's still, you're still up north. <laughs> we still have an ORDOC that you can look at. We've got all the things. So um, so we're, we're hoping to really work with those students as best we can. And as we get more information, we're gonna pass that along to those students as well. So thank you, great question. Awesome, all right, well thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Jeff so he can solve our housing problems. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and 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 you know, just again, you know, we look at some of some of the numbers we're trending up in in some of this uncertainty with FAFSA. Orientation numbers are trending up. Our housing numbers, in terms of where they were last year, um, are trending up. And certainly, you know, the the, the attendance we had at Wildcat Weekend um, being above where we were uh, the last few years. At, you know, th those are, those are all positive signs for growth in, in in the extreme uncertainty. And and thank you to to Carrie and her staff for for the work they're putting in. Especially, and, and, and Mike Rotundo and the financial aid staff to, to make all this, uh, um, you know, help provide answers, help provide information to, to folks who are struggling in the lack of information. So we are going to talk about housing, um, but first I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about orientation, which has been hinted on a few times. And um, <clears throat> I, I like to know my audience. I, I know we have faculty and staff, but I like to know a little deeper than that. Do we have alumni in the room? Excellent. And as alumni, I'm assuming you were, you were, you were good studious young people and you attended orientation as alumni. Almost half, half the hands went up. So, so if you attended orientation or you attended here as a student, you, you went through an orientation process that's very similar to the way it is, is now. We've had a three-day orientation process that goes back to the 70s. Um, and it's, it's pretty sacred. It's this, it's this pretty sacred process. For, for a long time, our, our orientation converts at 98%. Um, and we know we have a really unique, really special program um, that works. Um, we are looking at making some tweaks, and, and even with the 98% conversion process, I'm not saying that we're going to tweak and we're, we're going we're to build on that, but we want to tweak a little bit of our orientation process this summer um, to, to build on um, students getting to see some different parts of campus, some different parts of the community, and work on some items so that they can have a better sense of, sense of belonging from the time they arrive here back in August. And so I wanna walk through that um, just a little bit. We're working right now in that two and a half day, we're, we have two processes going on. We have a group meeting to look at the two and a half days and say, what can we pull out? What are some things that we can pull out of this two and a half day and maybe convert it to an online format to buy ourselves some time um, so, so that we can do some other things. Another group is looking at, as we buy ourselves some time, what, what can we do? And um, we certainly want to highlight different areas of campus. We want to highlight parts of Marquette. We want to highlight maybe rec or, or opportunities that might promote you know, some of our, 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 our values. Um, and we want to take some time for students to have a chance to reflect on what they've experienced in orientation. That, that to me is, is, is this culmination of the two and a half days to think about um, what do they want to do here when they come back in the fall? 
Get, get them to tell us. We, we want to survey those students. What do they want to do here? What is on their bucket list for NMU and Marquette um, so, that, so that they have this logged? What do, we think what, what do they think their struggles or their challenges are going to be when they return? Um, you know, are those going to be maybe something related to academic test taking, study taking, or study skills? Um, are they going to have maybe struggles with relationships or roommates? They get a little, they get a little taste of living in the halls. Do they see challenges there that, that could pop up in the fall? Um, do they see issues maybe navigating our campus? What, we, want, we want them to tell us what do they think those things are. We'll have a menu. We'll have an open area for them to, to, to express those, those, um, their concerns or those, those, those things they want to do to us. Um, and and we, want to, we want to utilize that information when they come back in the fall. And the third thing we want them to tell us is who do they want to be? We really think this two and a half days of orientation gives them a chance to think about themselves different. You know, many of those folks cross the graduation stage, in, in some cases, just a week prior to them attending orientation. At most, it's been a month. And that's a huge time of reflection. What, they, they'll, 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 we all had that moment when we crossed that stage in high school as to what, what it is it that we want to be. Um, and we think we have something unique as an institution to offer to that question. And so we want to ask those questions. What, what do you, what do you want to do here? What's on your bucket list? What do you, what do you think you might struggle with? And who do you want to be? Um, and we're, and we're going to collect that and, and use it so, so that when they come back in the fall, that information can hit folks if they're living in the halls. It can hit the resident directors, certainly the advising staff, faculty, um, different folks, so that it, at the very least they have some conversation starters. Um, and, and we also can collect some data from students so that as we're trying to program, as we're trying to use our resources to, to program towards what do they want to do and what are they going to struggle with? We, we have an idea of what that looks like and we can actually target that in um, maybe at a house level in the residence halls. Maybe it's, it's, we have a number of students that say they want to be part of certain student organizations. We can direct message to those students from those student orgs to start to pull them and get them involved. And so that is going to take some time in, in orientation to figure some of that out. But, but we're, we're, again, we're looking at some tweaking. So if you hear anything related to that, that's what we're doing. The big question is, you know, the big question we're asking is who do they want to be? And that's something we're, we're also trying to think about. How will we keep that fluid throughout their time here? And I don't have like perfect answers on that right now, but that's something where as I look out in the room and I see faculty in the room, um, if, if you know those responses and you're working with the student, that's something we want them to update. That's going to change for students as they, as they um, you know, go from freshmen to sophomore and juniors to seniors. Um, and we want to find a way um, to get them to, to keep answering that question so that when they graduate here, they, they kind of have a better sense of self. They, 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 they can see their progress from how they answered that question as a 17-year-old sitting in, 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 in the seats right here to crossing that graduation stage and they can see that growth. I think that's really, really, really important for their, their growth while they're here and beyond. So um, any questions on that? I'll just really want to hear about housing. Okay. So I, I really want to talk about, I don't, I don't have any, I want to, I want to be upfront. I don't have anything to share today there is no announcement that we're building housing, shovels are going in the ground next month. I do not have that announcement, so if you're waiting for that, I, if you want to walk out, that's fine. Um, I really want to talk about the demand and, and talk about the need for, for what we need to do here in, 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 in the coming months and, and in the next couple of years. As, as you might know, the off-campus housing market really changed in 2020. We saw a lot of student landlords uh, or landlords that really really, um, you know, uh, had, had houses that were, that were student driven, three or four or five uh, bedroom homes that were converted into single family homes um, for people, for especially folks that moved here to work remotely. We saw a huge change and every house that went for sale in that time was three or four or five bedrooms less for our upperclassmen students especially. Um, we also saw an increase in in Airbnb market in Marquette. And so every home, every college rental that was converted into Airbnb was a loss of, of, of bedrooms uh, for students off campus. Um, it's hard to know exactly like what, you know, what that impact was, but, but my guess is it's in the few hundred uh, bed, beds that were lost off campus for, for students alone. Um, 
So, so what has happened to those students is, is they have, you know, as they, as they lose their housing options off campus, they're moving back on. And so we've done things um, like with Spalding Hall. Spalding Hall exists down in the old Quad One area attached to um, Northern Lights Dining. This would have been the summer of 2021, I believe. Um, we realized that, that th there was a change in this off-campus market. We opened Spalding Hall in early July that year for upperclassmen students and sold 75 beds in three days. Um, and since then, we've, we've, we've held Spalding Hall, which has traditionally been an underclassman serving hall, and we serve that, we've used that hall to serve upperclassmen. And I think as of today, we have 150 upperclassmen living in that hall right now. Um, we also have seen the number of upperclassmen that choose to live in what have traditionally been freshman and sophomore halls in the woods or in the quad. We see juniors and seniors um, continuing to live in those halls because they don't have options off campus. We've reutilized Spooner Hall um, to house upperclassmen students as well. Um, and, and it's really creating a crunch. Right now today, we have 150 more students living on campus in residence halls, and that includes Spooner and Spalding and these kind of hybrid residence hall situations than we did at this exact same time last year. And if you heard what Kerry said, right now, we have 100 more housing applications for new freshmen than we did at this point last year. So, so um, we're really making some tweaks right now um, to prepare ourselves for what could be a really full um, on-campus housing environment in the fall. And I wanna run through some of those tweaks. I wanna be clear, these have been communicated to students, so anything you hear um, today as we talk about repurposing certain halls that has been communicated already to students living in, in those halls. Um, and right now, students who are returning to campus had already have already had the chance to sign up um, for their places to live next year, okay? So Spooner Hall, how many of you are familiar with Spooner Hall? Our, our, our only up-campus residence hall right now? Um, Spooner Hall serves 106 beds and has been here since 1956. Um, it was built in two parts, 1956 and 1958. Has a, has a mix of um, really cute little rooms with kitchenettes and then some really small connected suites that are like 10 by 10. Um, at one time, I think we could, we could probably advertise it, um, its, its charm. And, and as the years kind of chip away, it's, it's getting a little harder to, uh, to, uh, to market on that. Um, but but it's, 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 still, it's still standing strong and we're still utilizing it, even though in some of the campus master plans that we've seen from a few years ago, Spooner Hall wouldn't be there today, but, but it really speaks to, to the demand. So we are going to repurpose Spooner Hall. Um, Spooner Hall for a long time was an upperclassman serving residence hall. We started to use it um, to um, use as overflow in the last couple of years. We're going to go back to, to basically using Spooner Hall as a primarily an upperclassman serving residence hall and, and, and probably get about 110 to 115 beds out of there. We're going to over assign a couple of spaces in that hall um, to, to, to squeeze a few extra beds out, but we're going to turn Spooner Hall back into uh, an upperclassman hall. So if you were a Spooner Mooner back in, back in the day, Spooner, Spooner lives on. Um, Spalding, which we've used to um, use, or which we've recently used to, to, to serve upperclassmen students, we're going to do that primarily still, except for we're gonna carve out one house within Spalding Hall to use as overflow um, for freshmen. This is the only time I'm, you're gonna hear me up here use the triple word, the T, and, I, and I'm gonna stay away from it. Um, but we are going, any, any uh, rooms that we identify in Spalding Hall for, for freshman students, we will triple in Spooner. And those will be folks that apply to us really late. Those aren't gonna be any folks that are, that are currently applied. These are gonna be folks that are applying to us in July and August and are just, are just scrambling to find a um, you know, place to land, uh, to go to college and, and, and live. Um, so you will see that <clears throat> in Spooner Hall. My word, <clears throat> my, my cute word for, to not use the word, that T word, is over a sign. That's a, that's, I just made that up. We're, we're going to over assign um, some rooms in the quad and in the woods. Um, and, and so one example of that is when we, when we renovated quad two in the mid 2000s, uh, we created a lot of spaces actually for singles in those buildings. 
Um, building those in those single spaces aren't necessarily all being used for folks that maybe need a single. So we're actually going to convert those those one bedroom rooms to what are going to be three bed rooms um, because they're actually they have pretty ample size and they have private bathrooms in them. So we're going to look at those rooms and increase and increase um, the occupancy from one to three. Uh, we're also going to look at over assigning a, a, a smattering of rooms in the quad and then we're also going to over assign some rooms in in the woods the good thing is we're doing that now um, rather than waiting until july or august and so students who may want that as an option will certainly have the ability to do that and some of the benefits are a certain, well, i mean the main benefit really comes down to cost so we do have students who are looking for maybe more affordable room options and, and, and students who may choose to move on to those options and, and aren't necessarily forced into them. Um, and so that, that we think, the sooner we come out with that, we think will be some, some I think, some help and give students some choice in the matter. But, but certainly there will be some students, if they're applying late, um, that, that may not have choice in terms of that over-assignment. Um, so, some, some, some numbers here. If, just by making these Spooner and Spalding changes alone, nets us 27 extra upperclassmen beds. So we're gonna land at a higher upperclassmen bed count than we did um, this year. In terms of over assignments and what that can land us in freshmen, and, and, and we don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's we, we, on a basic level, we think we can buy 150 beds pretty easily. Um, beyond that is where we, we, we start to struggle and, and um, the housing staff, Cash, I see you Cash in the back, and, and Kat did their best this last fall to really open up some, some maybe unused uh, apartments that were used for resident directors previously um, to, to put students in. We had students living in all sorts of nooks and crannies this last year, and, and we'll continue to get creative to make sure that folks have, have a place to, to live in the fall. Um, and a and, and, and couple of things, you know, we want to make sure that you know, student choice is, 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 is given priority and, and certainly cost is, is um, taken into consideration. So if students are having a hard time or, or indicate that they, they want a more affordable option, um, you know, these over assignments might be, might be a way to go. Two, two things. Sorry, I'm, I'm like cold. I'm just like, whew. I lived through triples as a resident director 20 years ago. We had 100, we had actually 300 students living in triples 20 years ago on this campus and and as you know some natural kind of natural attrition happens we like we filter those folks back out so they get into you know uh, uh, more of a, a two-person living situation a number of those folks who had that option chose to stay we saw that happen 20 years ago and we saw that happen this year we saw folks who had the chance to break down we weren't going to change their rent they could continue to live you know, at the same rent if they were in an over-assigned situation and they chose to stay in those over-assigned situations because they like their roommates. And I think that speaks to the community model. It speaks to, you know, people being connected with one another and, and um, have no doubt we're going we're gonna to get through the challenges of what could, could feel like a very full on-campus housing situation. I got one more portion to the presentation, but I guess how about I take questions on that right now in case there are any. Gwen. Okay, a couple of things. Yeah. Hi, I'm a student here. Um, so as a student, like this concerns me because this would impact my college decision. Right. How open and transparent are you being about that with the incoming freshmen? Yeah, right now we haven't tripped the trigger fully into saying like, you know, this is, this is not, can you hear me okay? Like no. a bomb into a radio. Oh. Sorry. We, we haven't tripped the trigger fully into like, this is what we're advertising because we haven't had a, we're, we're working on what spaces are we going to identify. As soon as we have that figured out, we will. So it's not like, if you look at last year, we didn't advertise any of these over assignment situations until really like late July and August. And we're gonna be way ahead of that this year. In fact, we, we want them when they walk in, to, before they walk into orientation, if they want this as an option to know that that's an option. So, so we, we plan on coming out with that um, probably sometime in the next, I don't know, cash, maybe, maybe six weeks or so, some, sometime around our, our graduation. We really want to, what we want to do is let the numbers kind of settle out. Because right now we're running higher in apps than we were last year, but, but we want to see, certainly with FAFSA coming back, 
we, we want to see what some of that data will show us in, in, let's say, the next four to six weeks. And if I may, a second. Of course. Um, in my time as resident advisor, I know those singles were utilized a lot for ADA rooms and mm -hmm. students with medical conditions and who couldn't live with another roommate. Are we going to have enough options for those students to continue to be in those single rooms if you're using the ones in the quad and the woods? Right. I'm looking at cash. Yes. Um, when we take, a, take into account the number of applications we typically receive for those rooms, we'll still honor that typical amount of students that we that we serve. We're not going to put anybody in a double that needs a single. We're going to make sure that we have, but we but we have a lot of rooms designated as singles when we built quad. We kind of overbuilt singles when we built the quad. So not everybody living in a single in the quad right now needs one for some medical or ADA reason, but we will keep, we will absolutely keep some on hand in the halls for that. Have we thought about parking for resident students and is there enough space for them to park with all the other parking related issues going on? Right. I don't, um, Jim, do we have, do we have, we, are we looking at some parking near Woodland to, to create a gravel lot there? Okay. So to, yeah, to the east of Woodland Hall, um, we own a piece of property there that we're going to turn into kind of gravel temporary lot, um, to serve. Uh, on-campus students for some of this overflow. Hi, Lene Jobert. Um, just question on whether or not the policy is being discussed for having freshmen and sophomores sure. the two -year requirement? Have, to, have to live on campus, because maybe yeah. that could also help free up space if those students have enough mm -hmm. funding and there is available campus, uh, non-campus housing in Marquette sure. and surrounding areas. Sure. Um, probably not the policy as a whole isn't being looked at in terms of like trying to change it, but if students want to apply for, for an exception or an exemption because of, you know, being overflow and, and, and they might have, let's say, a family member that lives close by or, or some reason to get out, we'd certainly look at that differently now than we might look at it when we're, we're not, you know, as full as we might, you know, as, as we, as we're predicting to be, put it that way. But, but to look at it as a whole and go down to a one year requirement, which I don't think that's what you're suggesting is, but, you know, by doing so, we know that the off campus housing market can't, can't, I mean, it just, it just, we, it, it can't right now. I mean, it's, it's, it can't certainly, and that's, and that's being tested in Ishpeming to Gwyn, Ishpeming Nagani, Gwyn, Sands, um, students, students are not coming with transportation like they used to. So you got part of that. They, they can't move to Ishpeming, Nagani, Gwyn, Sands. Um, and, and we just know the local housing market can't, can't house them. That's why, that's why they're, that's why we're so jammed. We're leaving in August about 150 students on our waiting list that are going somewhere that are, that are probably couch surfing or doing different things in the community, you know, getting creative, um, because because there is there is you know so 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 little available housing in late summer. Hi, um, I joined NMU as in faculty in 2021, and it was extremely difficult to find housing here sure. as a professional, mm -hmm. um, both in the rental market and trying to buy a home. I mean, I had multiple examples where we would put an offer in a house, and people sure. would go over our offer on hundred thousand yeah. dollars in cash. So. I was just like, in the future vision, the scale of this problem is much smaller than for students, right? But yep. there's models that, you know, even at Michigan Tech, they have temporary housing for faculty, just mm -hmm. so that we have somewhere for new faculty to land. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't find a housing situation until like several weeks before I was supposed to start here. So yeah. I think that that's something important to consider in like the overall picture. and. I think it's really important for retaining and attracting faculty here. Absolutely. And that is, that is something we are, and, and kind of my, the next portion of my presentation is kind of, so what, like, what are we, what are we going to do about this? And we are looking at, at, um, you know, trying to build and, and faculty and staff housing will be a part of, of, um, uh, you know, anything that we build here in the future. I don't have exact numbers yet, but we will, we will incorporate faculty and staff housing into that. Lincoln. Right. Are they still faculty dorms, or are they married housing? No, it's all single student housing across um, across Lincoln. 
um, and that was a decision made probably 15 years ago because of the student need. We were, we were seeing students walk away from Northern because they didn't have housing. And, and at that time, we think we thought the community had a little bit better opportunity to house more faculty and staff. And so that, that decision is, is one that was made, like I said, years ago, and we're still hanging on to. Sure, sure. Oh, great point. Thank you. Um, any any last questions before I segue into what we're trying to do about it? <laughs> All right. So campus master plans um, throughout the last 15 years have identified different spots for housing on our campus. And so this just highlights um, um, uh, housing uh, spots set aside in our 2019 campus master plan. So as you can see, if we start look, kind of looking north at, at site one, um, that's a site near the current Woodland Park. Um, site two is a, is a residence hall site attached to the woods. This almost came to fruition in 2019, 2020, um, uh, but then as, as we got into 2020, it, 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 it stalled and, and probably rightfully so. Um, option three is, is in the old Summit Center um, lot. What's pictured there is it was probably some academic building, some form of Jacobetti at the time we were discussing, instead of renovating Jacobetti, placing Jacobetti near that Summit Center location. But that is a spot also that was also designated for the potential of having campus housing again. And then um, site four, help me out, Jim, site four is the, sp the current Spooner um, site. And so we can't really add housing to that Spooner site until we, until we do something with Spooner. And then site five um, is, is located near Presque and Fair, um, just north of the roundabout um, by Tamaki and T, um, the, the, the former range bank and, and the subway location. And so um, these are all sites that have been identified throughout previous campus master plans. Um, and as we've looked in the last few months to try to identify what, what, what seems like logical sites to land housing on um, easily, affordably and something that would be attractive to students, the two that seem to, to sort of, um, you know, s seem to be the easiest in, in terms of that model would be Site 5 and Site 3, where former Summit Center um, housing existed. And so we're, we're in some, some internal discussion, we're in some discussion um, with our private partner as to, as to what we might be able to do there. We think 400 beds right now is, is about the right um, total to try to get to, but there's some things there. We know we have aging housing in terms of Spalding and, and, and Spooner, and those are things that we have to address. Um, and so 400 beds isn't exactly 400 beds if we might have to take some, some, some upperclassmen serving beds down in the future. And again, a part of that 400 beds will also serve um, some number of faculty and staff as well. And so we're looking at, at studio units, two bedroom and four bedroom um, units to serve. And, and just some, some things that, that as, we, as we think of priorities for this project, affordability to students is certainly at the top of that list. Um, privacy, privacy is something when we, when we built the woods, you know, six, seven or eight years ago now, more and more at that time, that's pre-COVID, students were talking about the amount of privacy and, and, and options that we had inside of those living spaces that spoke to privacy. They, they certainly wanted, uh, you know, those highlighted. There's a certain level of amenity that students might want, especially in apartments. And so we're looking at maybe units that might have kind of in-unit um, washers and dryers. That's something that's become more, um, more, I guess, the norm and certainly more attractive to students. Um, and, and then this idea of location. Um, and so option, option five up here, um, which has been you know, on a campus master plan going back for more than 15 years, provides some interesting attraction to students because of its proximity to the athletic facilities, uh, you know, the, the rec center, and certainly some of the things that students want to do on Third Street in terms of shopping, dining, and, and, the, and the corridor to Washington Avenue. And so, it also fits in with our Wildcat Way. When we think of Wildcat Way, 
kind of strimming up um, through campus and, and probably having some, um, some entrance uh, to the athletic facilities near that intersection probably plays into, into that as well. And so um, I don't want that to come as a surprise because, because option five has been kind of on the campus master plans for, gosh, two, since 2008, I believe, as a, as a proposed housing site. Sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna point I'm gonna point to them and then I'm gonna come back to the mic. This is Fair running east and west, and this is Presque Isle running north and south. So we have F Fair running east and west, and Presque Isle running north and south. So that's where that the bank on the corner, the subway, Tamaki and T and Smoothie King. That's that's right right at that intersection. Right, so, we, so as we look to develop that, we have a few options. Um, we own much of the property that exists north and south on Presque Isle, and then the property that would be just to the northeast corner of Cohotis, there's a parking lot, a pretty underutilized parking lot there that could potentially um, hold some housing in that, in that block as well. Right. How about, how about questions? <laughs> These lights are pretty warm. I don't know how you faculty do this. Is there a possibility of partnering with the foundation and the new, the old hospital property for any housing? I know at one time that was uh, probably discussed. I'd probably turn that over to Brock maybe to answer that. I, I know it's, uh, there's been discussions at varying points related to that. Sorry. <laughs> are high high interest topics um, yeah well so so good and the question I think I think you got it on the mic was there any discussions uh, around the old hospital property and um, you know the short answer uh, which I think is the right answer is uh, you know whether it's me uh, or really anyone on campus um, it's been a while since I've seen any specific plans about what what the development is going to look like there but I'll also tell you, I mean, I have a sense, and I think that as that project was kind of discussed, the community got a sense of what was likely to be there as well. That's not university property. It's not going to be foundation property. I think the developer um, has said publicly that they're looking at various types of housing, like some, you know, maybe some apartment and townhouse style housing. I think some single family homes. I've heard, um, you know, also some uh, senior living uh, uh, facility as well. So my sense is that there's gonna be a mix of housing on that property, some of which could be interesting to different segments of our population, you know, our student population, our employee population. But we've had no direct conversations about like trying to buy some of that land or you know, lease some of the land and build like a northern dorm or anything there. I think that project and then some of the other projects that are popping up around town are gonna to add to the inventory in town. Um, I have questions, I, this is way outside my wheelhouse, but uh, I know construction costs have, have become so high that there are serious questions about the extent to which any new construction is really gonna be affordable um, you know, for a lot of the folks in Marquette who are seeking housing. And I don't know that one way or the other, I just think that um, one of the attractive elements of our project, I mean Northern's project, is that for our upper division students, and I agree, absolutely, we're committed for our faculty and staff, at least new faculty and staff, that this will be um, uh, an option that would make sense for many of our faculty and staff in terms of, of cost, and also be of, you know, of high quality. Uh, and you know nothing is cheap these days. So you know we've run into a few circumstances where, you know, we've looked to partner on childcare, and high quality childcare. And then you look at well, what is that partner going to ultimately charge? It, it it's still a really high amount, but that's just the the nature of like the cost of living these days. And so um, the housing project that we have in mind is primarily meant to serve the student capacity demands we have, but I do think it's also gonna provide an attractive option to at least some of our um, faculty and staff. Uh, and we'll have to figure out whether it's temporary or not, but that will be part of the plan. 
I don't mean to take Jeff off of the hot seat, but maybe his, his forehead sweat has calmed down a little bit here. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm happy to, to, Jeff, did you have anything else you wanted to add or? You, no, yeah, no, okay. Yeah. Well, we're all ready to maybe answer questions and then uh, after those questions run out, I can offer some concluding comments. But Josh, you, you got uh, Just to follow yeah. up on that, when the NMU Foundation presented to the city council the plan for this property, the city council did, or at least a few members of there were quite vocal, but the council seemed to agree as a whole, um, I attended it, the council seemed to agree as a whole that this had to have affordable housing. Uh, so as we know, the developer that eventually was chosen um, has higher prices around town. So um, I plan on obviously watching these prices and going to the city council and um, asking if they are indeed affordable. Um, and anybody's welcome to join me because this obviously would help solve this problem of upper class students um, well, upper class, as in juniors and seniors, having a place to live. Obviously, our upper yeah. class students are fine yeah. uh, <laughs> in terms of economically. Yeah. Uh, but Marquette's getting hard to live in for everybody. Yeah. And uh, the city council has promised, or they at least told the foundation, and obviously the foundation is at least tangentially related to our interests, um, that this had to be affordable housing. So I think demanding that that is actually followed through on the part of the sure. developer could be a good way to solve some of these problems you're talking about. Sure, sure. Um, sure, I, I, and you know, you bring up uh, some good points, which is sort of like how the supply of housing it has a, a ripple effect on the rest of the community, and some of that's around the price point. Um, we're building this housing out of NMU's sort of institutional interest, what we want to do for our students and for our employees. I do believe that the kinds of students that are going to be attracted to this housing, and also if, if we are able to attract employees to this housing, it, it will create more space off campus in terms of the rental market at the very least. And so, you know, you sort of reduce the demand for housing a little bit. You hope that maybe that softens up the price points and, and hopefully could at least cool off the, the market. And so I, I just be candid. That's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we think it makes sense for us. But I do think there's some kind of externalities that will be beneficial to the community as well. And, and great point on, on the, the hospital property. But the excellent point, Josh. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Is that you, Richard? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Richard. Yeah, oh, Richard. The lights are really bright up here. Yeah. 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 Um, if it's, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Like, if it's hard for people to be here and come here, has it been looked at or considered, like, investing more in um, going to, like, outside Marquette, you know, like, whether it's public transportation and maybe there's hubs you know, in local areas, you know, like Nagani or Gwyn or something where pe students could end up getting settled. I mean, I don't know. Just kind of thinking out loud on something like that. Yeah, um, thanks Richard. Yeah, this, um, that conversation has come up on several occasions, like since I've been here and it actually, it occurs to me quite a bit as well. I mean, we make that drive out uh, to the West End quite frequently. Um, incidentally, I think, you know, whether it's because more of our employees and students live there or not, Northern's got to increase its presence in the West End. And I think we have a good presence, but I think that just more and more we need to be really connected. The transportation thing, look, there are s smarter people in the room than, than, than me uh, when it comes to, to all sorts of things. But on this, on this front in particular, I do know that some of the subject area experts have said, gosh, um, it is challenging to figure out what kind of capacity we would need to develop. I mean, uh, what type of transportation, how frequent the routes would run, you know, what you do in terms of encouraging employees or students to kind of plan ahead and let us know when the most popular time might be for us to load up with six or eight people or 15 or 20 people and bring them in. None of that suggests that we just throw our hands up in the air and say it can't be done. I don't mean that at all. It is, it is on a list of things that I would categorize in my own filing cabinet as like awesome idea. It seems like there's a ton of potential there, but actually turns out to be very difficult to implement in a way that makes sense for us financially. And, and if you can imagine, I, I think the danger is that you just see some empty, empty Northern buses kind of moving around at times that don't end up making sense or they don't pick up people at the right places. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I just think we got to study exactly what type of system would be most use so that we get the most kind of bang for the buck out of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question regarding the uh, 
public trans transit, Mark Tran has a well-established route. How much does NMU interface with Mark Tran in terms of planning public transportation around Marquette and Alger County? Yeah, I love usually kind of trying to answer a question in a roundabout. I don't know. That's the answer to that question. I don't know. There may be people in the room who know how frequent. <laughs> a rhetorical question. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you have the answer. Yeah. 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 So then I call Mark Tran, yeah. and they say the same thing. We don't know who to talk to at Northern. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's a place we need to go. Yeah, uh, it sounds like a good idea. And, and I don't know whether, in fact, I mean, um, I understand what you heard. I don't know, in fact, if we do have, you know, uh, any kind of regular meetings or any kind of communication. Um, hasn't come across my desk, so fair, fair enough point. Yeah, so this kind of draw, goes back to something we were talking about at the beginning, which is parking. Yeah. If you have more commuter students and it's and or faculty, and it is going to happen. I mean, new faculty um, really wanted to live within walking distance of campus will not happen on a single faculty salary. So you know, I'm out in Ishpeming now. That's that's the way it's going to be. That's what you can afford on a faculty salary nowadays. Um, and, and I know students, I have students in my class who talk about commuting from Nagani. And so if you're gonna have more commuter students, what are you gonna do about the parking situation? And have you ever thought about putting in a parking garage to you know, get more parking in a single, in a, the same amount of area? Yeah, is this a follow-up or is it, uh, cause I, can, I mean, I, I can address that question. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I didn't hear you answer her question. Yours is independent. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so, you know, one conversation uh, that I did, uh, you know, become aware of, I think there was discussion of whether the foundation and the developer would consider keeping that parking garage that's right across the street from uh, the Northern Center. And I don't know the details of that study, but I think evidently that study determined that the repair costs for that um, that parking garage were, I don't know, five to $15 million or, or something really uh, eye-popping. Um, so a parking garage um, is really appealing. And <clears throat> actually I've been on a campus, I was at the University of Georgia for 10 years and I saw them actually um, take out all of the internal parking on campus and build a set of four parking garages around the edge of campus. There was like a north, I mean, directional, north, east, south, and west. And they would have people all park there and then, you know, walk into whatever your prospective building is. Um, and uh, the cost of that is immense. Maybe Jim or Kathy could give me an updated figure, but it, it may be, is it 25000 a space or something like that? Twenty-five or $30,000 a space? <clears throat> Yeah, $25,000 is per space is a dated number. So I love the idea, um, but you know, <clears throat> we talk a lot, and by we, I mean a number of, I, I'm sure conversations happen. It's like, well, Northern is investing a lot of money in, uh, in projects, capital projects. You know, why, how, those investments come from a good place, right? Um, they're meant to, you know, designed to meet student needs, faculty needs, campus needs in various ways. A lot of careful thinking goes into those projects, and there's like, you know, dozens and dozens of project ideas that come to mind that really would serve a need um, for every one that makes it through to the finish line. And something like a parking garage, given where we're at right now, you sit down and think about twenty-five thousand dollars a spot. You know, so a hundred k for four spots, a million dollars for forty spots. Pretty soon, that price tag becomes hard to justify, and it doesn't mean parking's not important. But it's like, okay, well, are there alternative options like a temporary lot by Woodland? Is there an opportunity for us to think about shuttles in from the Superior Dome back to campus? We still have parking out there. Those seem more attractive to me, given our desire to make the best use of the the, the scarce dollars we have. Excellent question. I mean, I, th I think we've kind of dived into that. Yeah. So when I worked at the University of Washington about 40 years ago, they offered a substantial discount to buy a city bus pass with mm -hmm. the intent of encouraging um, people using yeah. public transit rather than the limited um, mm -hmm. parking um, near campus. Mm -hmm. um, that worked because they had an effective public transit system. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Tran routes are really limited. Yep. The, 
maybe with the right con kind of conversations, NMU could um, offer free transit with the uh, um, idea that doing so would be cheaper than parking. Yeah. Um, love that idea. I think a key element there is the is the service from Mark Tran and, and whether that would suit our needs. Um, you know. Thanks, Rhea. So I think the key then is on unavailability. Yeah, they're not they're not great. Um, and that's I mean, you talk to the city commission or the city manager and, and the financial crunch they have and where they think it, they can invest their dollars. And I think expanding that service, I'm not sure that would be something that happens in the, in the near, near term. So, and I'm, so first of all, I want to say thanks to, to Sean Reese. Um, thanks to Jess and Carrie. Um, I think you got to understand the, the most difficult question for an admissions director is like, what's the entering class going to be in the fall? And so I admire your bravery for answering that question reasonably uh, directly. Um, uh, here's it. Jeff, thank you as well. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget your notebook um, here. <clears throat> um, really, really important topics that you closed on. And so thanks. I'm really excited to see what your orientation continues to look like. Uh, Nicole, you know, I know you and Jeff have worked, uh, you know, very carefully on some of the redesign. It is a tremendous kind of first experience for our students. I'm glad that 98% of our students end up coming here after orientation. But among those students, it's not just that they come here, it's that the orientation experience like allows them to land here when they finally move in, just really well equipped and feeling a sense of agency and belonging already and, and ready to succeed. So it's not just about like getting them to campus, it's about what orientation can do in terms of their retention, persistence, and completion. So it's a big deal. Housing as well. There, I, Fairly soon, I think we'll have some news on how things shake out with housing. Um, so thanks to everybody who presented. It, and of course, you know, um, 4.50 p.m. or so, thanks to all of you for, for being plugged in during this event. Um, I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine what these forums uh, feel like from your vantage point. And there are multiple vantage points in the room. We have... Uh, community members, Diane, I see you there, uh, and, and other community members in the audience, students, staff, you know, faculty, other administrators. Um, we had at least one, we, a couple board members uh, in, in the audience. I sat in events like this, kind of university forum type events when I was faculty, and I remember having like mixed feelings about them. Generally, you know, some things were of particular interest, some things seemed um, exceptionally hard to stay focused on because I thought, well, this is pretty mundane stuff. Why would anyone be an administrator? And then there are a lot of kind of smack your head moments. You're like, how can they be doing this? It just doesn't make any sense from my vantage point. So there it is. Um, I'll tell you, um, and we have a, a couple folks on this uh, stage who've spent significant time as uh, members of uh, the faculty in, in, uh, here or elsewhere. Um, I've been in that seat. Like, I understand uh, at least the faculty perspective. Um, and I, one interesting observation that I've had as I moved into an administrative role, I mean, ultimately this role, you know, as president of an incredible university, is um, this realization that the work I used to do in designing a research program and, you know, maybe uh, engaging some students or collaborating with colleagues in my department and the intricacies of identifying like the research question, the design, appropriate methodology, um, you know, data analysis techniques, uh, initial assessment, all of the politics and messiness of journal submissions, the crazy peer reviewers who clearly never even read what the proposal, what the grant proposal was or the article is that you submitted, the frustrations there, ultimately the persistence in trying to, you know, revise and resubmit for the umpteenth time, the stress of having to balance your teaching, uh, your scholarship, your service to the university, the stress of different kind of promotional moments, job security, I've been contingent, I've been term, I understand that. I understand the process of going through the tenure, proce uh, the tenure process. So here's the takeaway. The group of people on the stage, the questions we confront and the way we approach them are not so dissimilar from the work that I used to do, at least as a faculty member. The kind of nature of the question is different, it's kind of more disjointed 
because it's parking and orientation and legislative outreach. So it doesn't fit together quite as well, but like the intellectual nature of the puzzle is pretty similar. The persistence required in order to sort of poke away at that puzzle and figure out what the best avenue is, it's pretty similar. And ultimately, like the things that we care about as we're trying to communicate all of this, it's in service of the students and the, communi the community and the region we serve, that's who you all care about as well in your work as a staff member, in your work as a faculty member. Our students who are here, ASNMU students or otherwise, you care about your peers who are here. We're doing this in order to support this amazing place. And, um, and so we'll keep doing these things. Um, and I invite your feedback if there are ways we can make them you know, more engaging. I thought this was good, by the way. I mean, I, that's not up for me to decide. You all have to let us know whether it was good. But let us keep making these better and, and sort of more useful um, uh, for you, no matter what your vantage point is. But understand the place that they're coming from and understand like the motivation and the place that the people who are presenting to you are coming from. Because we all actually are fit together pretty neatly in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here together. Um, like I said, uh, take care of yourselves. This is um, in 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 a couple of different ways been a particular um, particularly tough uh, stretch for our for our university. Um, but we're getting closer to uh, the end of the semester. I love this time of the semester because we get a chance to look back on the last year and and. and participate in a lot of celebratory kind of recognition oriented events and so I look forward to seeing you all there I thank you for the questions in person here today and then I know um, Cindy Pavla who's kind of the the behind the scenes logistics person for these events would be happy to receive feedback or kind of commentary and what we can do to answer questions you didn't get a chance to ask and to design these and iterate and, and, and adjust over time so that they make the most sense for you all okay uh, anything else from the panelists? Okay, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.